In this episode of Influencers, Environmental Defense Fund President Fred Krupp. We don't have a choice with global warming. We face certain extreme penalties for keeping on business as usual. In any sector, if a CEO isn't thinking about this, it's malpractice. We're trying to inspire them to do better, but we're also holding them accountable for results. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Fred Krupp, who is the president of the Environmental Defense Fund. Fred, nice to see you. Great to be here. Let me start off with a timely question that is linked to your work, and that is, what is an economic downturn, potentially a recession, mean in terms of fighting climate change? Well, it means people are going to be more cost-conscious, and that cuts both ways. But in a positive way, people are looking for ways to save money. Energy efficiency is a way to save money. And right now, believe it or not, electric cars are far cheaper to run than gasoline cars. And also, uh, alternative energy, solar panels on my house are saving a bundle in electric costs every, once, uh, every month. So um, I'd say there's some positive effects, but of course, for the world's sake and for everyone's livelihood's sake, we hope this downturn is uh, short-lived and, and uh, shallow. And another obvious big event that we're all watching closely is Russia's invasion of Ukraine the impact that's having on energy supplies to Europe. And there's talk, of course, of those economies turning back to coal, which, of course, is a big negative from your perspective, right? Yeah, in the short run, uh, look, we've got to take care of people and their needs for electricity. There needs to be warm in the winter. There's no doubt that those humanitarian needs today take precedence over everything. But in the moderate uh, to long term, uh, we're seeing Europe really race to... Uh, do energy efficiency, do heat pumps that save a lot of electricity, uh, move to electric vehicles. In fact, the whole world has seen the instability of relying on oil and the need to electrify transportation and, and homes and businesses. So in the long run, I think um, the tragic situation is going to have a positive effect for the climate. Is there um, a place for nuclear energy? Absolutely. Um, you know, First of all, I think it's uh, insane that Germany has been shutting its nuclear plants, the ones that have a proven track record of being safe. Um, they shut three at the beginning of the year. They were, were scheduled to shut three at the end of the year. They're rethinking that. Last I checked in, I think it was likely they were going to keep at least two, maybe all three open. We, in the United States, um, almost... 19% of our electricity is generated by nuclear energy. We can't afford to have a much steeper uphill climb toward clean energy by shutting those plants uh, before we need to. Of course, it's got to be safe. In terms of new nuclear, I think those of us who care deeply about the climate have to be uh, open-minded and embrace anything that can be cost-effective and competitive as well as safe. And so far, a lot of the nuclear technologies, at least the United States, have not passed the cost test. But I'm certainly hoping and promoting government support to do research and, and get um, the cost down. Leaving aside the cost, though, what about the safety element of nuclear power? You seem comfortable with that? Well, this obviously all new nuclear facilities, as well as existing ones, need to be regulated for safety. We can't endanger people's lives. But the overall track record of the industry is good. There's been notable exceptions. But I'm confident the safety issues can be solved and need to be solved. We don't have a choice. With global warming, we face certain extreme penalties for keeping on business as usual cor course. So yeah, um, nuclear needs to be at the table along with all the other solutions that, um, you know, thankfully solar and wind have come dramatically down in price. Tell us about environmental defense. Um, what does your organization do specifically, Fred? 
But the Environmental Defense Fund has uh, been around since 1967. We um, are deep in scientists, economists, engineers, problem solvers. You need expertise to not only uh, complain about something that isn't good, but to figure out how to be an architect of the future. And so for over 50 years, we've been piecing together um, solutions, working directly with business when we can, um, because then we don't have to go through the government process, which can be laborious, but working also with governments and policymakers, uh, not only in the United States, but now globally, to address the biggest problems we have in a way that also addresses not only the climate needs, but also the human needs, the absolute need for food and shelter and, and prosperity. And that's the sweet spot when we can solve for climate and solve for people's um, you know, livelihoods as well. I want to ask a lot more about uh, your work with the private sector. But let me ask you a broader question first, Fred, and that is how would you assess the progress that we've made fighting climate change? Well, it's, it's too slow. Um, the steps we've taken so far are inadequate and small and incremental. We need big and bold now, or we're headed for a train wreck. We're already seeing the effects now of everything from droughts to intense rainstorms to hurricanes, uh, increased flooding. Uh, nevertheless, there are green shoots. And um, you know, in the United States, the passage of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, Mm -hmm. is, is tr tremendous. It's a game changer. And so that is one of several things I would point to that we can accelerate progress just as we need to. Let me, let me ask you to drill down on IRA and the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm a misnomer from your perspective because, well, it maybe addresses that, but it also has some uh, environmental facets to it, or that's a, a major part of it, right? Oh, it's the biggest thing on climate that's ever been done by Congress, and there's really nothing in second place. What, is it, what does it do? What do you hope it will do? Well, according to Credit Suisse, uh, it will leverage $1.7 trillion of investment into clean energy, uh, these clean technologies, into manufacturing facilities for batteries to store electricity to compensate for the intermittent nature of wind and solar. It will accelerate the transition to electric, not only cars, but also trucks. You know, a, a consumer can um, get a tax credit of up to $7,500 by purchasing a new car, $4,000 by purchasing a used car. And a business that buys uh, electric vehicles for its use can get up to $40,000 tax credit. So these are things that will accelerate the transition, and that's the acceleration that we need. What about the private sector? How much should a CEO focus on climate. I mean, this really speaks to shareholder capitalism versus stakeholder capitalism, a controversial topic these days. Well, you know, uh, the whole ESG thing is controversial, mm -hmm. and there's the E and the S and the, the G. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on the S and the G and can't speak to that, but on the E, mm -hmm. I'm not sure it needs to be controversial. Good CEOs have always been looking around the corner for what is the next big transition that's happening in society, and what openings does that create for profit-making enterprise? This transition to clean energy is going to make the whole explosion of the internet look like a kid's lemonade stand. There are going to be huge profit-making opportunities. There's some vulnerabilities as well. I mean, I think the CEOs that don't get it are going to be case studies in business schools, not in a good way. Mm -hmm. But those that do get it um, are going to be able to reap huge profits. I, I would say in any sector, if a CEO isn't thinking about this, it it's malpractice. And that's from an economic standpoint, forgetting about the need for our children and grandchildren and having a planet that can survive. I understand you want to just split off the E from the S and G. Nevertheless, Fred, it seems that these state attorneys general, plural, that are going after Wall Street firms like BlackRock, part of it is about the environment and about them 
um, pressuring uh, oil companies, for instance. Are you concerned about this polarization affecting the work that you do? Look, Andy, I am concerned. There are legitimate critics raising real issues about ESG, and then there are the politicians trying to score political points. I'll tell you this, if I were running a business that was going to be put under restrictions in one of these states, you know, asking CEOs to put a blinder on on climate change, I would get out of that state and do business somewhere else because it's irresponsible, as I said earlier, to be in any business now without um, addressing both the vulnerabilities but the risks of flooding if you're in real estate and or have a business in many parts of the country, unfortunately, or the opportunities which are, are legion. Talk to us a little bit specifically about some of the work you're doing with big name companies. I, I understand you're doing something with GM, uh, EDFs, your recommended principles on EPA emissions. Yeah, so uh, I've known Mary Barr at GM uh, for seven years now, and we've stayed in touch even when we've agreed to disagree. But after um, President Biden was elected, starting in the fall of 2020, we agreed that it would make sense for our teams to get together and look at where could we agree that would speed the transition to GM committing potentially to an all-electric future. After four months of that dialogue, the, in late January of 2021, Mary Barr and GM committed to all electric vehicle sales by 2035. And um, they credited the dialogue as being one of the factors, the dialogue with EDF as being one of the factors, making it easier to see how they could make that commitment, how it would be complemented by public policies we would jointly support, uh, like sensible new emission standards for vehicles, as well as things like EV tax credits. Um, more recently, um, just within the last few weeks, the uh, GM and EDF have agreed jointly, I think this is unprecedented, on principles that both um, GM and EDF could sign on to as EPA designs its next generation of car standards for model years 27, 28, 29. And as you know, in the auto business, uh, it takes so long to design and engineer uh, cars that, um, you know, that's today. So we look forward, both EDF and GM look forward to EPA speedily mm. putting in place strong standards for those years. Um, so that's, that is one example, and we're doing similar things with truck manufacturers on trucks. We've also worked very well with Bill Ford and, and Ford Motor. Um, you know, uh, we've had dialogues with Tesla, with, which really led the way, and Ford, of course, with its, with its Mustang and F-150. And GM now has the Equinox, a $30,000 vehicle um, coming out in a year or so. It's um, pretty exciting as these things become more and more, as EVs become more and more accessible to every man. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about EVs, Fred, in terms of adoption, and when will we have an all-EV world? I mean, how far away is that, for instance? I think it's much sooner than people think. You know, in the United States, we're now at, uh, just a couple of years ago, we were at 2% new vehicle sales. We're already at 7%. China, 24% of all new vehicles are EVs. Um, you know, basically, they're, they're cool cars. They give you clean air, but they're fun to drive. You don't have to stop at a gas station. I mean, pretty soon, the only people that won't be wanting an EVA, forget about climate reasons, just because the performance is so damn good, are people that enjoy spending five bucks a gallon on gasoline. I don't know many of those. How is it going to work in cities, though? It seems like that's not solve for EVs, charging if you live in a metropolitan area? Well, yes, charging has to become much more ubiquitous. And going back to IRA, mm -hmm. uh, there are tremendous incentives, subsidies, to get these charging stations in uh, parking garages, apartment buildings, um, uh, shopping places. So uh, I think we will solve for that. But you're right to point out charging stations 
is something everyone's got to pitch in together and work on. And the utility companies, the electric utilities, are, of course, very excited to invest in those stations and help. And yes, they can make money selling the electricity, but the oh, filling up your car to go the same number of miles with electricity you know, can be a quarter to a half as expensive as gasoline. So it's a pretty good deal. You mentioned Tesla. Can you talk more about working with them? And also, what is it like talking to Elon Musk about this stuff, if in fact you have been? Yeah, I've had uh, the occasion to uh, meet with, have dinner uh, with Elon Musk. Uh, we occasionally, um, you know, have an exchange by email or text, had phone call with him, phone calls with him. Um, he's a visionary, and I think um, it's impossible not to give him credit for demonstrating the fact that electric vehicles can be extremely desirable, again, forgetting about the environmental or climate benefits. And, uh, you know, he caused uh, a revolution in the auto industry. There's no two ways about it. You worked with them on a satellite um, recently, well, they being Elon writ large, SpaceX, right? Yeah, Talk to so us about that. Well, uh, yes, we're building a satellite for $88 million. Happily, it's all built and paid for, and it will, be, whom? it will be launched next year. We've had private philanthropists mm. and foundations uh, pay for it, um, too many to list, but, um, you know, John Arnold, the Robertson Foundation, and, you know, on and on, uh, mm. many people have contributed, in, including um, uh, the Bezos Earth Fund, and Jeff Bezos, and um, the satellite's been uh, built uh, by Raytheon and um, and uh, Blue Canyon Technologies. Uh, the bus is being built, um, has been now built by uh, Ball Aerospace, and it will be launched next year by SpaceX. And um, it will go into lower Earth orbit. So we have worked also with oil companies because the problem of methane pollution from oil and gas wells is a big one. Um, I'll get back to the satellite in a second, but let me just ex explain this. I think simply of the emissions today from human-caused methane into the atmosphere compared with the emissions from burning all the fossil fuels, CO2, mm -hmm. that human-caused methane over the next 10 years will warm the planet more than all the CO2 from burning all the fossil fuels. Now, the CO2 to be fair, we'll continue working for 100 years, so we have to address both. Mm -hmm. But in terms of having an immediate impact on the temperatures you and I are going to see, the ferocity of storms, the intensity of rainfall events, uh, the, the biggest bang for the buck is by reducing meth methane emissions, which we have to do. So we work with oil companies. They've let us um, test their oil wells. We found out that methane pollution was 60% more than what EPA had estimated. Uh, the oil companies are now making promises to reduce their emissions um, by huge amounts, uh, the vast majority near zero. And the satellite will be real time for free information available to everybody to hold folks accountable, to see who should get credit for doing exactly that and um, who the spotlight needs to shine on because they're not. Wait, so let me get this right. Your satellite's called Methane Air. Meth um, the satellite's called Methane Sat. And methane Sat. And before it launches, we have planes using the same instrument, and that is called Methane Air. Okay, so Methane Sat. You're putting this satellite up into lower orbit specifically to monitor methane emissions. Yes. That's the best way to do it? That's Yes. You know, we spent $20 million um, monitoring them with handheld infrared cameras, uh, using airplanes, using drones, and we got tens of thousands of measurements. But the satellite, one satellite, will be able to look at every major oil and gas installation around the globe uh, multiple times a week. Mm. And um, so it will give us real-time information that we're going to make available for free. And I think that sort of transparency and accountability 
represents the best of the Environmental Defense Fund working with companies. We're, we're cooperative. Uh, we're trying to inspire them to do better. But we're also holding them accountable for results. And that's the most cost-effective way to do it. That's it that, is. Yeah, wow, that's yeah. crazy. So talk to us about some more work that you've done with the private sector. What companies have you partnered with in which ways? In well, we've worked with uh, Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Doug McMillan and his predecessors have set very aggressive goals um, to um, reduce their emissions. They also set a gigaton goal to reduce emissions out of their whole supply chain by um, a, a billion tons a year. What, what does that mean? What, is, what does mm -hmm. a number like that mean to anybody? It's the same amount as Germany. Uh, same amount of CO2 Germany puts into the air in a year. So it's a big deal, and um, they've been um, real leaders in convening their supply chain and um, putting an emphasis on effic efficiency and lower greenhouse gases. We've worked with KKR on their portfolio inv of investments. Uh, we have worked with FedEx on uh, new, new uh, truck models. Um, so yeah, we, we've had a lot of, I think, very successful uh, opportunities to partner with companies um, and um, from companies like that, mm -hmm. we don't accept contributions. So mm -hmm. when we um, we're not uh, inhibited to criticize them if, if that's warranted, but when we do praise them, which is far more frequent, um, people know it's on the merits. You also partner with government. I, I want to ask you, are there any government policies that we should dispense with in fighting for the environment? Well, uh, subsidies for the fossil fuel industry certainly come to mind. That's a hard one politically. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but, um, you know, that comes to mind first because, um, you know, it's not just climate change. Uh, when you drive a, a diesel truck, you're hurting people's health. And so the, the first place where we should be electrifying um, vehicles is these distribution trucks, urban vehicles, garbage trucks, taxi cabs. Um, and it will not only be good for the climate, but uh, be good for people's health. So that fossil fuel subsidies come to mind. Certainly, there's other things that we need to do. We need a lot of policy reform to speed the installation of clean infrastructure. But we've got to be careful to do that in a way that protects the rights of local communities and uh, environmental justice uh, communities as well. What are the biggest misconceptions that people might have about fighting climate change? I think, Andy, the idea that um, it's hopeless is the most important misconception. And climate change is an overwhelming problem, and the whole world has to get on board in order, order to solve it, including China and India and European, European Union and the U.S. Those are the four biggest emitting geographies. But uh, it's not hopeless. We are seeing real action in, in China. We talked about their leadership in electric vehicles. We're seeing real action in Europe now being speeded up by the tragic war in the Ukraine. We're seeing the U.S. Um, take a, a big step forward with the passage of IRA. And uh, we're seeing India having committed to having 50% of its electricity come from clean sources by 2030. So um, this is solvable, but it's um, sometimes I think about the difference between optimism, which is kind of like a prediction, it's all going to be mm -hmm. fine, and hope. Mm. which is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. We all need to work at it, and, and then we can solve it. Sort of along those same lines, Fred, what are the most effective climate change solutions and or strategies? You talked about a lot of progress around the globe. Are there specific ways to achieve those ends that you can point to? Well, um, things that are right there for the taking right now are preserving forests. Um, there's a lot of different solutions. We've talked about transportation. Um, we've talked about electrification. But um, natural uh, 
the natural world provides solutions to. And the first thing we should do is just stop burning our forests and peat bogs. It's about 20% of emissions. And for that, there's wonderful leadership um, by uh, the Amazon company and many other companies, including uh, um, McKinsey and BCG, which have teamed up for something called Project LEAF that offers to pay jurisdictions, it can be a state of Brazil or the Congo, to preserve their forests. And this provides a financial reward. So that's one. On methane, it's not just the oil and gas companies. It's also agriculture. And there's ways farmers can be part of saving the world and reducing methane emissions from livestock. There's now solutions coming to market for that, um, as well as just farming in different ways that reduce the nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer basically getting wet. Um, these, um, there's a lot of things that are at hand that we're not doing enough of. Those are two that I would point to. Overall, Andy, as you may know, um, many economists say the, the best thing we could do is put a price on climate pollution, whether that's carbon or methane. We did that for methane in IRA, which is good. And increasing parts of the world, including China and even sections of the United States, have emissions trading systems or carbon taxes. Um, pricing the externality is a way to make sure that in every decision, the cost of poisoning our atmosphere is taken into account. Recently, I think you guys have been critical of hydrogen-based solutions, Fred. Why is that? Well, I th actually, I think hydrogen is going to be a big part of the future when it's made in like a one place by wind turbines or solar um, and used there to make green steel, for instance. But what people haven't known until now, and the reason that our opposition about some uses of hydrogen comes as a surprise, is that hydrogen itself is a greenhouse gas. Not directly, but indirectly. Um, it, is, um, it actually extends the shelf life, the half-life, technically, of methane. It creates water vapor and, um, and, and ozone, which it's them, they are greenhouse gases. And so um, this is why the idea of putting hydrogen into natural gas distribution systems or using hydrogen to fuel trucks and cars, thousands, tens of thousands of them, those ideas um, need to be stopped. Mm. I don't know if you saw this uh, news report that came out today, I believe, Fred. The U.S. Treasury is saying it's proposing a new rule to collect data on climate-related risks from property and casualty insurers, one of the first concrete actions in a new push to beef up financial regulation to help fight global warming. What are your thoughts on this move, and how can financial regulation help in the fight against climate change? Well, um, this is really important because as, as climate risk uh, becomes a bigger and bigger factor in economic decision making, we need the SEC to require disclosure. And if, if You've been watching what's happened not only in Puerto Rico, but in Florida, uh, in Texas, all around the country. Uh, there, the risks of flooding in particular um, need to be incorporated in decisions as to um, uh, what a real estate portfolio is worth, uh, what the insurance is going to cost. And so... Um, SEC should require that, not for climate reasons, but for simple uh, reasons to inspire better um, business decisions. You have been president of the Environmental Defense Fund since, what, 1984? Exactly. So <laughs> it's quite a while. So tell us how your job has changed and how has um, the environmental movement changed in those intervening decades? Well, uh, you know, EDF has changed and grown a lot. We've been able to take on different projects. I've had, I got my dream job when, when I was very young and um, have been, you know, blessed. But 
the environmental community has changed in a lot of positive ways. One, um, when I started um, economic incentives, uh, things like emissions trading, carbon taxes were looked upon as, as bad almost. People should just do the right thing because it's the right thing and not need an economic incentives. Uh, David Brower tour called economics an advanced form of brain disease. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that the whole environmental community is now for emissions trading or carbon taxes. They are not unified with one voice. But now, um, I think the vast bulk of the environmental community sees the value in certain circumstances of using uh, these tools so we can align what's profitable with where the world needs to go. That's happening anyway on certain issues like electric vehicles, but it, we need to make sure everything's aligned. So that's one change, increased receptivity to economic incentives. Another is there's just a lot more coordination between environmental groups now, there was a lot more competition when I started. And that's very, very healthy. And I think it's inspired by the fact that we all see how uh, grave the challenges are. If we can't work together, um, how can we expect to make progress? Fred Krupp, President of the Environmental Defense Fund, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andy. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.